first of all, again, uh, kudos and thank you for coming in on a beautiful day like this. I mean, at least you know that this isn't the only one, right? Um, and hopefully you'll get at least a little sunshine. Um, to the, this afternoon's presenter is Sue Hickey, who is coming, I guess it's also part of the organization, um, which is the Stibular Disorders Association. So Sue obviously has uh, the stibular disorder, which I will admit, I don't know a lot about either. Um, and we'll just let her go with that. The sign-in sheet is going around, um, and I'll make sure I won't run away until everybody's gotten, it, gotten signed in, okay? And be sure, feel free to ask questions as well. It's pretty informal today. Okay, so I'm Sue Hickey. I've had vestibular disorders for 17 years. Um, I want to introduce Cynthia Ryan, who is Executive Director of the Vestibular Disorders Association International, headquartered here in Portland. Um, I'm really happy to be here, although I might not look like it because I don't feel that great. Uh, I had some absolutely fabulous medical help, again, coming right here from Portland, Good Samaritan Hospital. Um, and much admiration for the people who work treating people like me. As you're going to hear, it's pretty damn tough. It's hard to diagnose us, it's hard to treat us, um, and we are often sort of shunted aside. So to have the opportunity to talk to you in the hopes that maybe you will see somebody who seems disoriented, um, not very coherent, uh, expressing silly symptoms like dizziness and nausea and you'll understand what they're going through and help them through that's a big deal to me to have a chance to talk to you so thank you very much um, I want to just ask and I think I know from Miriam that you don't you've not like studied the vestibular system great so my rudimentary patient oriented description is going to go by you just fine um, so basically, it's this very sophisticated, complex micro system that is so elegant that coordinates ears, eyes, and joints and muscles to send signals to your brain. And basically, those signals are telling your brain where you are in space. And then your brain sends signals back out through that system so that you can operate safely in space. So when something happened to my ear, my ears were sending different signals to my brain. They weren't the same signals that what my eyes were sending. And what I'm gonna describe to you for the first two years before I got a diagnosis was that my body was basically on alert, alert for two years because my brain was saying, this isn't, this isn't working for me. This is, this is not the right information. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is talk about those first two years because they're absolutely miserable. Um, you can't believe the random list of symptoms that you've got. Nobody else seems to be able to make much sense of them either. And you don't even really know what to observe because somebody's not asking you prompts that cause you to say, okay, well, I'm going to watch for that so I can come in next time and, and tell you what's going on with me. Then I'd like to talk about, um, I'll go quickly through my diagnosis and treatment and then talk about sort of life today, the symptoms I have today, um, the kind of limits on life today, and end up with a real quick summary of ways in which my experience of healthcare professionals has been very, very good and ways in which it has been quite disappointing and I hope it could improve. So for a baseline, um, I want to talk just a minute about my life before I got sick. I always hated this label, but um, I was a type A kind of person. I worked at the Bonneville Power Administration, which by the way is not at Bonneville Dam. It's right across the river in Lloyd Center. And I worked about 70 or 80 hours a week, had about 10 to 12 meetings a day, ran from meeting to meeting made public presentations all the time, traveled every week to our outlying offices, testified before Congress, really loved my job, very important to me, very active in it. 
Um, I was married, active member of my synagogue, entertained a lot, traveled abroad, typical sort of life. Uh, ran five miles a day, skied, biked, hiked, uh, sailed. I love my life here in Portland, and I think I was pretty much a, a typical Portlander. And basically, um, probably a hope, like most of you, I would say I'd never really been sick a day in my life. Uh, which means to me, if I got sick, I went to the doctor or I went somewhere and somebody said, oh, you've got fill in the blank, gave me some medicine, I went home, two days later, boom, I was fine. And within two months, I forgot I'd ever even had that experience, couldn't remember it at all. But in 1997, I had a quick trip back to North Carolina to visit my family, and I had a cold when I got on the plane, flew back there, felt quite badly while I was there, um, basically only stayed the weekend, got on the plane, flew back, and I woke up on Monday morning, right after I'd gotten back, and tried to get out of bed, and the entire room was spinning. And the thing I can compare that to the best is, um, how many of you have ever been to like a carnival, on a carnival ride, and you get off, and everything's going like this and spinning around you? Um, it just kept spinning and spinning. So for about half an hour, I sat there and thought, oh, okay, what am I gonna do? I got up slowly, and I kind of felt my way into the shower, that helped a little. And then I took a little walk, that helped a little. So I went on into work. I, I felt I had to go into work. Um, and I let that go for about a week with this spinning that turned into nausea and finally went to the doctor. And it turned out that his biggest concern was I was totally deaf in my right ear. Um, so that zinged me right down to the MRI machine to see if I had a tumor which I didn't have, so then everything became really calm, but it also became <laughs> just this big morass of nothingness. Um, from there, I ended up spending two years searching for a diagnosis. I saw nine specialists um, and was extremely frustrated with the experience. Later I came to learn, there's a, a study that's been done that's shown that vestibular patients take three to five years to diagnose, on average, three to five years, they're walking around feeling like I'm gonna describe to you, and they see seven to nine doctors in order to get a diagnosis. So it's quite typical, characteristic of our problem that it just this extremely protracted diagnosis time. Um, and that's why I'm involved with Cynthia in the Vestibular Disorders Organization, because this, is, this has gotta change, because your condition is clearly deteriorating, and in fact, I think some of the things that are still going on for me could have been corrected had I been diagnosed earlier. Um, okay, so the early symptoms were, of course, the deafness in the right ear. That went away in six to eight weeks. My, my hearing came back. I wasn't ever really that concerned about it anyway. I could hear out of my left ear. Um, the vertigo recurred at odd times that I never quite understood, but really kind of settled into dizziness, which um, that term never had the richness for me that it now has and that it developed over that period. What I would define as dizziness really is a sense of movement, and it was different things if I was standing up, um, movement was the fact that the ground always felt like it wasn't quite stable under me. So I couldn't walk a straight line. That was a test that everybody seemed to want to give me and I could never do it. That one where you put heel to toe and walk in the straight line, couldn't do that at all. Would fall over, in fact. Um, and when I was walking at work, I would walk like along the wall, holding on to things. Um, because the walls seemed to move and close in on me. That was my perception. Um, and often I, I was just sort of lurching and stumbling along was how I felt. Yes? Could you drive during that time? <laughs> really good question. Um, yes, I did. And it was really dangerous. Um, because the other thing that happens is the movement 
especially occurs when you move your head. So what I decided to get to the Lloyd Center, I thought I'm not going to go across that 405 bridge because there are lots of merges from my house, which is right up the hill, and I couldn't turn without everything starting to spin. So you go for four-way stops, basically, because then you never have to turn your head. So I figured out how to get to work with all four-way stops. Um, but it was a bad idea to drive very much, and still it's pretty hard for me because the same thing happens, but that's a great question. Um, when I was sitting down, even when I was sitting down, because um, I had a lot of time to ponder this, I realized that sometimes the movement was outside. The room would move. In fact, I was one time I was sitting with a friend who has dizziness problems too, and she and I were chatting and we looked out the window at a stop sign and she said, whoa, did that stop sign just move? And I said, yeah, it did. And she said, how much did it move? And I said, about six inches down and back. She said, darn, me too. Which was, it's so fascinating to correlate this with other people with this problem. Why would the damn stop sign move? Um, but sometimes the movement was inside my head. There was sort of a pulsing inside of my head or something that seemed to be going kind of circular. Um, so needless to say, all this movement going on all, all the time makes you nauseous pretty fast. Um, so I walked around for two years feeling nauseous. I wrote these copious notes every day about how I felt, and every single day for two years I wrote down nauseous, which is really not that helpful after a while. Um, let's see. Oh, um, and it's not that you do this all this much, but the other thing that's extremely difficult still is looking up, um, particularly to the right, I would fall down. Um, I'm still not quite sure why that happens, but looking up, um, even if you're looking at a stage looking up, if you're too close, is, is a real problem. But certainly trying to bird watch, for example, and, and look up. Um, gives you the sense that you're that you're falling. Um, I had a lot of headaches as well, and after about a year, the headaches turned into migraines. And after a year of nausea, dizziness, headaches, migraines, I got exhausted. And my first diagnosis was chronic fatigue, which was. I don't know if you've talked to anyone with chronic fatigue, but it's a totally not helpful diagnosis because at least at that point there wasn't anything that anybody could do. So kind of felt, made me feel better, like I wasn't crazy, but it didn't help me at all. Um, there are a whole list of other things I just want to go through quickly uh, that I thought just were random and ridiculous. I had muscle and joint aches, which didn't make any sense to me, but got me diagnosed with fibromyalgia. But now that I understand the vestibular system that I described to you, it makes total sense that you would have muscle and joint aches because your brain is sending these signals, help keep her upright all the time. And you see so you're clenching your muscles and your joints are trying to hold you up. Um, my ears rang constantly, still do, that never changed. I had all sorts of vision problems. Um, you s I just had to close the curtain here and this light coming in from the side. Don't know why that happens. Um, also had uh, visual migraines recurring, particularly when I was driving. Um, oh, this is one of the funnier ones. I had a, a real sensitivity to loud noise. Um, and that sounds pretty no big deal, right? Stay away from loud noise. So there's an employee meeting, and I was, um, it was a pretend like you're on the Dave Letterman show. Be the manager, go in, have people interview you and spoof you, and I said, okay, well, I'll do that. And we're sitting, I'm sitting where you're sitting, and there's the Dave Letterman person up here. And as I'm walking up onto the stage, a band starts to play, like this big tuba and I fell over into the wall. It, it literally knocked me over, and it happened two more times when I was in a, a situation where there was a band and some loud noise hit me. So really serious kind of noise sensitivity, not just this is slightly bothering me, but it knocks me over. Um, heart palpitations, stomach cramps. Okay, so this is, a, this is a personal thing to mention, but one thing I've learned 
Miriam has encouraged me to mention these things. One thing I've learned from vestibular disorders is when I say nausea, you think vomiting, right? No, maybe you don't. Um, well, what I learned from my wonderful Dr. Black was some percentage of the people are going to vomit and some percentage of the people are going to get constipated. And that's where my stomach cramp thing came from. It was excruciatingly painful. And at times I thought, gee, please, you know, I wish that I could be sick because the stomach cramps just, just got worse and worse. Um, one of my doctors, I, I, got, I became incredibly emotional um, over weird things like you would ask me if I could drive and I would start to cry sort of thing. And what I learned about that was that, um, this is an interesting one, balance is an executive function, says my balance doctor. It's like breathing and heartbeat. Um, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of other things can get jettisoned, but, but your brain is going to keep you in balance. So um, emotions and controlling your emotions, or in fact, even the thing that I'm gonna bring up next, the ability to think and speak, those things will all go by the wayside if your balance gets too challenged. Um, so I, even today, get in situations where if my balance system is overloaded, um, I can't talk and I can't even think. My brain just won't do anything. I was at dinner a month ago and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden everybody turned to look at me and said, so you haven't said anything in half an hour. And I went, oh my gosh, I haven't. I wasn't even thinking. I was totally not aware of anything. I was really sick and I just had to leave. But my husband needed to figure that out because I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't think at all. Okay, so I'm wandering around feeling like this, writing these things down, trying to think of not just the symptoms but the situations that caused them. As close as I could come was um, heat, when it's warmer, things are worse. When I'm under stress or fatigue, it's worse. Um, when I'm traveling, it was definitely worse. Um, and the way that I had to uh, find doctors was basically on my own. I networked with my friends, I read a lot of books, um, I just made appointments with people and went in to see what they would come up with and I got lucky. Uh, I finally ran into the man who would put me in the right place because he um, was dabbling in the chronic fatigue area and his name was mentioned in a book and he was at Oregon Health Sciences University. So in other words, it was completely random, but he was um, joined together with the man who is an otoneurologist and did diagnose me because he felt a lot of folks who were told they had chronic fatigue had definitely had chronic fatigue, but they had it for a reason. And the reason that he felt I had it was my balance problems, and he turned out to be right. But it was um, a moment I'll never forget when I went into his office and listed all this seemingly unrelated stuff that I listed for you, and he explained every piece of it and why it fit together and what he thought I had. So um, I think that this is really uh, unsatisfying, not a good process for diagnosing vestibular patients, and. Um, I'd love it if you guys would think of something that Cynthia and I can take back that would be a good road to try to follow to try to make things better for vestibular patients. So, okay, over the next seven to eight years, so here I am diagnosed and oh boy, cure coming up. And over the next seven or eight years, um, there's sort of a rolling diagnosis. Um, the organs of the ear are not um, viewable. It's not like you can open it up and look in there. And at the point that I was being diagnosed, it's better now, but MRIs didn't have the resolution to see what was wrong. Um, so you go through an absolutely fascinating series of tests on balance platforms that simulate what I'm telling you. The floor moves and the walls move and you're in this harness and a computer registers when you fall, basically, and your eye movements and all sorts of things. So this doctor determined that I had what's called a paralymph fistula, 
and that's a rip or a tear in my round window. You're nodding. You've heard of this. Yes? No? I've been through a lot of that diagnostic testing before. Ah, huh. Ah, good. Um, so um, the first thing I did, he, he diagnoses this, and the cure, uh, since he's very conservative, is bed rest. And that means putting absolutely no pressure on your ears. Um, for seven weeks, I sat in a chair and I was up 45 minutes a day to go to the bathroom, to take a shower, to eat, everything, 45 minutes a day, and otherwise you're sitting in a chair. Um, and I could have opted for surgery, but he thought that was a better way to go because of the secondary effects of the surgery. So I live in a house that has three stories, so I could go up and down the stairs once a day. Um, as I said, I'm married, so this is like no sexual relations for not just those seven weeks, but for three months, which was sort of a hardship. I sleep sitting up. Um, it was a really difficult time, and the symptoms were um, quite strong during that time because the ear was closing. So there's all sorts of pressure that you're experiencing and things that you don't understand. But that worked, um, and then you go through a whole series of rehab, and what happens secondary to this fistula, the rip in your ear, once you've got that, um, your inner ear is, is filled with spinal fluid, and uh, it, no, it is self-regulating before it's punctured, but once it's punctured, it's not self-regulating anymore, and mine never over the next two years could self-regulate. So I went through a period of um, rolling what they're, it's called endo, endolymphatic hydrops. And the symptoms are exactly like the symptoms of fistula. I mean, it's dizziness, headaches, nausea, <laughs> vertigo again. So it always panicked me, like, oh no, have I opened the fistula? Um, and so finally after two years, what we figured out was I needed to change my diet. I was vegetarian and I thought that was really great, but there wasn't enough protein in my diet and I needed to take a diuretic for that. About five years after that, I developed almost constant, um, do you know BPPV, benign positional vertigo? It's um, frankly the easiest, luckiest thing that I had. You have these like uh, otoliths in your ear and sometimes they shed in the wrong place and when your head moves in that direction it makes you experience vertigo, but if you keep your head out of that position then you're absolutely okay and you can go in and they can flip you over and generally that resolves but mine never did there's something wrong with my ear canal so I have it for 11 months out of the year so they're just this series of things that develop um, and after seven years I reopened my fistula again so this time he did surgery and discovered that I in fact had a congenital problem I had a a little blood vessel running through my round window and the, the bed rest really wasn't ever going to solve my problem that I probably needed to have surgery to begin with but we couldn't have seen that and couldn't have known. Um, but the, the healing up after that surgery was much, much better than the bed rest because I knew that it was closed and I had so much experience by that point. I don't want to belabor this except to say that um, the treatment is better than the diagnosis because you know what's wrong with you, but the testing to figure out exactly what you've got, even though you know you have a vestibular problem, always makes you sick with the same symptoms. That's the point, is to do the test <laughs> to see what symptoms it causes. And then once you have the treatment, you go through vestibular rehab, and the way that you recover is to adapt and to adapt means to have the symptoms again. So that often causes people to stop trying to do the rehab because it's horrible. You go in, you're feeling okay, and you do the balance platform thing, or you do things where you're looking at cards side to side or moving things up and down, and you leave after an hour feeling totally sick, and it takes you a couple of days to get over that, and it really wears you down. So eventually, um, you get better, but you've got to go through a lot more symptoms in order to get better. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through symptoms today. The, the thing I've never been able to get over is motion sickness in crowds. 
Um, my ears and eyes have never gotten their act together. So a crowd for me is three people. Certainly this is a big crowd. Um, and what happens is after, starts about 45 minutes, um, I'll, my heart will sort of start to flutter, my stomach will start to feel bad, I'll get kind of a sharp headache, maybe something will move. Um, and if I stay in the situation too long, which is often like 90 minutes, things like not being able to talk or think will start to happen. And Cynthia's seen it happen at our meetings. Um, the kind of events, um, going to synagogue, I really, really can't do that for more than an hour anymore. Shopping, sort of out, um, concerts, you know, you, you name it. But think of something that you do that doesn't involve a crowd. If it's three people, it's, it's pretty limiting. Um, the thing about it too is the after effects don't just go away immediately. Sometimes it's two or three days. Travel motion, uh, I actually have something called mal de debarkment. Um, so I would ask, is anybody here a sailor, boater of any kind? Have you ever been on a boat for long enough that you don't, you need your land legs back? Um, the problem for me is if I go on a boat, I might never get my land legs back. So I can't go on a boat, but I have no idea why this happens, but once you have the condition I have, you entrain the motion of the vehicle that you're in. So when I drive in the car over to my vacation house in Bend, that's three hours, I get out and I feel like I'm still in the car. And I do this, I invented um, a technique where we stop every hour and I do this dance like this to try to shake the motion away. It helps, you're laughing, but it kind of helps. Um, and then I have some meds I can take that sort of knock me out that help as well. Um, but that's, that's a pretty terrible one because it's real limiting not to be able to travel. So I just do it anyway, but sometimes it takes a week to get over traveling because traveling's very difficult on your system. Um, I still have high drops. In fact, I have it right now, and it made me pretty nervous about coming because things just leave my mind and I can't, I can't get them back. But you look pretty forgiving, so I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, heat is a real cause of high drops, and that was one of the things I was noting early on is when it's, when it's hot, the fluid balance, since mine wasn't regulating, it was clearly making a difference to fluid balance. If you get any kind of infection, and this was another key, I have herpes, I've had herpes a long time, and it took three years for my doctor and I to figure out that that was my trigger, that that was triggering the continuous high drops that I had, because it was this infection that was always in my body. Um, the worst thing about high drops is it makes everything worse. It's like a magnifier. It's bad enough on its own, but it makes the crowd symptoms worse, the travel symptoms worse, and all of that. I still have BPPV almost all the time, and something that I haven't mentioned is um, because all this stuff is going on, I developed insomnia um, and had, some, had a really cool time at the sleep lab over here, only to figure out that it had nothing to do with anything except for the fact that I had vestibular problems, which um, I could have told them, but it was worth checking out. So impact on my life. Um, I haven't worked since 1997, and any time that I try, um, I run right up against crowd exposure. Uh, it's pretty difficult to work without some kind of crowd exposure, and I can't be on the computer for more than about 40 minutes. There's something about the computer screen flicker that's, that's really a problem. Um, and if I try to do that day after day after day, it's just, just downhill, back into the can't think, can't move sort of deal. Um, my husband jokes, we do go out to dinner a lot, or particularly lunch, because uh, there are not as many people there, and he likes to joke that we go to places right before they're about to go out of business, because I need it to be quiet um, and not have a crowd. Um, grocery shopping is absolute limit of 30 minutes. I don't know what it is, but everybody vestibular agrees with this. There's something about all of the product in the tall aisles, there's some distortion that occurs there that really invokes symptoms. Um, shopping in general, I'm an online catalog shopper. I don't, don't go in stores. 
Uh, because this was a problem, my um, physical therapist at one point suggested, well, let's try to adapt to that. So um, I was going to Pioneer Place Mall and trying to stay for longer and longer and longer times every day, and then I just gave up. I said, I can't, I can't do this. It's not worth it. I just won't shop. I do go to concert and movies. Yeah. So is it like people moving all the time or people being around you? Or is it like we're sitting here and we're quiet, but like would it affect you? I mean, is it affecting you or is it more just like the movement of people and noise? I th you know, it's, a, it's again a g really good question. Um, I know that it's worse if there's more movement. Like I chose the Pioneer Place food court because I thought that would be, you know, really a, a good test. And that's, that's a nightmare. That's impossible to tolerate. But even just the head nods and slight body movements um, and the light that's coming in back there, yeah, it's, it's bothersome. It's a problem. So I think if there's a scale, you know, it get, the more movement there is, the worse it is. Um, what else is interesting here? There are coping strategies. Clearly, since it's my eyes that are not agreeing with my ears, so if I go somewhere, like it's great to go to the symphony because I just go in, I sit down, I close my eyes. And I can hear the symphony just fine with my eyes closed. But I go to dance performances, don't get much out of them with your eyes closed. So you, you gotta uh, adjust your strategy. And I can sit in a movie theater in the very back. If I sit too far up, the scale of the things that are moving is too big for me, so the motion is amplified somehow. So this has taken a, a, a lot of experimentation. Uh, you asked about driving, yeah. Um, I was gonna add, earlier you mentioned you and your husband couldn't be Absolutely, yes, after the bed rest, but this was two bed rests, so this is a good sport of a husband. Um, you asked about driving, yeah. Oh, with the movies, um, do you not see action films because that would be too much movement on too big of a screen? Pretty much don't see action films. Okay, so do you? And 3D is a nightmare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever any episodes of Fainting or Blacking Out? No. Never did. Yeah. Is, is vestibular disorder different just from general vertigo? I mean, is there like more added, are there more added symptoms or have you, have you accurately described as just vertigo? No, um, it can't be um, because it, the BPPV, the benign proximal positional vertigo, that's the part of vestibular disorders that is purely vertigo. That's, that's the symptom, is vertigo. But for the fistulas and high drops and a whole series of other things, there's far more just dizziness, disorientation. Um, it's not necessarily vertigo. And I'm just not familiar um, whether vertigo is a symptom of other illnesses. I don't know. Hopefully, I don't find out. Yes? Uh, did they ever figure out what specifically caused the fistula? I know you had said you had the inflamed, the inflamed artery. Was it when you went on the airplane, you weren't able to pressurize, and you had a blowout? Did that generate the fistula? Yes. Okay. Um, basically, what happened was my eustachian tubes were blocked, and that's what generally takes the pressure. And because they were blocked, the pressure went to the next weakest point that was my round window. Now, that ordinarily wouldn't happen, but I had that blood vessel running through it, which made it weak enough to rupture on the plane. But that made it a tough diagnosis because it was unusual that that would happen. Generally, it's a car accident or some sort of um, construction worker with a blow to the head or something like that. Yeah. You mentioned changing your protein intake. Did you also have to change salt and water and good, alcohol? Good question. Um, the, when I first realized that, that high drops was a problem for me, and that's the fluid balance problem, at that point, um, the diet was a, 
It was a moderate salt diet, not high, not low. So you were supposed to monitor salt intake and be sure it wasn't too low or too high. Um, and the next time I did bed rest, my doctor had been experimenting with his patients with the zone diet, which is a certain combination of protein, protein carbohydrate, and fat. Um, still, not getting rid of the salt, sort of keep your salt level, no big variations in that. But the zone diet was amazing for me. I mean, within a week, I was controlling the high drops without anything. So it's, that's changed my life. It's changed the way that I eat. Um, it's really been a big positive. Diet was a big positive. And I don't know of too many other places that recommend um, that kind of diet to go along with the treatment plan. Doesn't alcohol change the viscosity oh. of the fluid too, the viscosity? Well, you know, I don't know. I've never been told not to drink, but I don't like it. It just, it's very disorienting to me. And even times when everybody around me is having a beer or something, I'll have like a sip of beer and go, ugh. I mean, it's just within, you know, one or two sips, it's just making me not feel good, just dizzy and not clear. And I've spent enough of my life feeling not dizzy and unclear. You know, for, there's a particular, vestibular disorders is kind of an, it's an umbrella term, and then there are lots of different types of vestibular disorders, so it has several of them. One of them is called Meniere's disease, and that's one of the more common ones. And that particular one, which primarily involves the, uh, the high drops, having a low salt diet, and no alcohol is a big uh, recommendation for people with that. So um, since you're asking, uh, so I just, I want to say something positive because I've been sounding like a real Debbie Downer here. Um, what this forced me to do was figure out what can you do with this life. And um, I realized, I excavated an old desire to draw and paint. And so I've started to draw and paint and I can do it totally by myself. And I find it hugely satisfying, and I don't think that I ever would have done it if I had kept on working. And I wrote a book about my vestibular problems, and never in my life would I have dreamed that I would have written a book. And in many ways, um, I am a much more compassionate person. I'm a better friend to my friends. Um, there's, there are riches in having a chronic illness, and having some insight uh, about your own limits and your own weakness. So I don't want to make it sound like poor me. I don't, I don't really feel that way about it. Um, I, I do want to end my talking part, though, because I was asked to speak a little bit about medical interactions and the things that were good and the things that weren't so good. Um, and first off, I wanted to just give some examples of routine kinds of treatments and the things that are helpful or not. Um, and top of that list is the dentist. Um, it's, it seems like it shouldn't be any problem, but um, if you think about it, they immediately put you in that chair and it seems like to me, stand you on your head. And when you're having somebody fool around in your mouth and you're spinning wildly, that's really, really uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, I keep trying to train them. I really can't go that far back. And if we can find some way, so now we've got it so I'm kind of flat and they put my head on a pillow and everything works out fine. But the drill um, is just, talk about noise sensitivity. That thing is incredible and it's just echoing inside your head. So a day at the dentist is, you know, one or two days lost for me and there's almost no way around it, uh, even if they're accommodating. Um, Colonoscopy, really, really interesting. You guys are way too young to have done this procedure, but if you think about fluid balance, you're drinking your weight in fluid and then losing it again. So I have to start like two days beforehand with my prevent mode on high drops in order not to end up with a week-long problem after a colonoscopy. Um, and I went in for a cataract surgery a um, couple of years ago and so this is an interesting one, not that relevant to this topic, but interesting. Um, I've done 12 years of rehab to get my balance system adapted again, and it's eyes, ears, muscles, and joints. And so my right eye had a cataract. And 
um, I'm going to talk about my wonderful optometrist in a moment, but when he saw that, he said, do not let them correct your eye to 2020. Um, because if they corrected my eye to 2020, I would start all over again. Because then I'd have a 2020 eye and this eye, and they wouldn't any longer be communicating the way that they were. So I needed to leave the correction exactly the same as it was in this eye. And that was a real fight because um, unbeknownst to me, that's sort of a shaming thing for an eye surgeon to leave that crummy old lousy vision eye there that I would still have to put a contact lens on. Um, but that's huge benefit from my optometrist that he was thinking forward. So he's, he's a good example for me. I have two doctors, um, my optometrist and my chiropractor, who by the way, um, my chiropractor saves my life. Um, he does cranial sacral work and works on my body alignment, which is incredibly necessary because I get, you know, when you think you're spinning, you lock up your shoulders and your neck, and he understands that and works on me. In fact, he took the initiative to go over and watch some of my tests and watch a rehab technique I was using that was causing me to do certain things with my body. Took time out of his schedule to do that so he would understand why I was having certain sorts of problems so that he would know what to do for me. And my optometrist joined the Vestibular Disorders Association and constantly consults the website so that he knows the kinds of symptoms that I have and the sort of things that I experience. So these people are exemplary to me and I feel so grateful to have them. Um, in terms of my observation, uh, nurses are absolutely the best communicators of anybody that I deal with. Um, nurses are generally the people that are taking your history, um, who are then knowing your history, searching for ways that they can accommodate you, um, asking what would help and what should you watch out for that might disturb you. Um, there's really nobody else that's doing that, frankly. Um, so if the nurse is doing that, they're, they're my absolute best friend. Um, they're somebody that you rely on, in fact, to do that. Uh, one of the worst things for a vestibular patient is to sit in a crowded waiting room. Um, now, if you think about it, it now maybe you don't feel this way yet, but after two years of not knowing what was wrong with me and going to doctor after doctor, it's a pretty agitating experience to go into a medical waiting room. And I have my list of what I want to talk about, but if I'm sitting there for 30 or 45 minutes in a room that generally could have 20 or 25 people in it moving around, a lot of noise, I, I've lost it by the time I've gotten back to see the doctor. I can't even remember what I wanted to talk about. I'm on the verge of tears, and anything they say to me, I'm not going to remember. So I've requested any number of times, um, could I be moved to a room in the back? Um, the worst people to ask are the reception people. Um, I, I would have to say that they are the absolute Achilles heel of every medical office I have ever been in. <laughs> um, they're rude. Um, they're only interested in their own procedure. They have absolutely no patient orientation and they will never go out of their way for you. They treat you with disdain as if you're the problem. Why are you here? You're the problem. Um, and that's, that's very, very difficult for someone who's feeling pretty overwhelmed with their illness anyway. Um, the other terrible sort of problems that I had um, were being dismissed as if the problem was in my head. Um, when somebody can't automatically look at your list of symptoms, and somebody usually being a doctor, um, somehow they seem to take a front that I came up with something that they couldn't tell me, so it must be in my head. Uh, and I, I think I saw four of the doctors for a year. Um, several of them were quite polite about saying, I'm clearly not helping you and I don't want to waste your time. But others clearly blamed it on me. Um, the fact that they couldn't diagnose me was my problem. Uh, and to be, after spending a year with someone, to be dropped cold, um, blind alley, dead end, searching for a diagnosis is, is really devastating. Um, it's, it's extremely emotional. So, um, in conclusion, I, I have learned an enormous amount about being a patient. 
Um, and what I would suggest to you is there's a lot to learn. Um, my generation at least walks into a medical office and expects an answer and expects the doctor or the medical professional to be all powerful. And it took me four years to learn that um, it's a team and I am the team lead. I'm in charge. They are technical advisors, but I need to be on top of everything. I need to ask every question. I need to be providing the information. I need to make the decisions. But people don't know that. Um, and the more that you can help them know that, the better off that they'll be. Um, in general, though, I'm extremely grateful for the experience. Your, your field is a really exciting one. There's so much going on. There are so many dedicated people. Um, and I welcome your questions, and I wish you much success. Yeah. I have two questions. This one is, while at home, just performing your normal activities of daily living, um, which ones do you avoid, or at least avoid completely, or at least make adapt adaptations to, like some people would take for granted, being able to bend over the sink and brush their teeth, or bend over and do dishes mm -hmm. in the dishwasher. What do you have to completely avoid, or special adaptations that you've made? Okay. Um, Everybody hears this, right? Special adaptations, just normal daily living. Um, probably the main one is uh, because of the, the fistula, I can't lift things over 20 pounds because I probably have the same vein in the left ear. So I've got to be really careful. And that's pretty difficult for somebody who likes to take out the recycling and grab the yard bags and do all of those things. Um, otherwise, oh well, no, there are a lot more. Um, I have three sets of stairs in my house. Um, and I have a bunch of plants on the top deck, for example. I fell down the top stairs one time, putting a plant in each hand and trying to go down the stairs. So I fell down the, the stairs. I have to hold on going down the stairs. Um, other things. Um, it's just a matter of taking, holding on, going up a little step ladder rather than just whipping up the step ladder and opening something, that, that kind of thing. I could probably think of more, but when, when you're doing a bed rest sort of deal, you can't even open the refrigerator because that's, you know, putting pressure on your ear. Um, having a bowel movement was incredibly difficult because you can't bear down when you're not trying not to put pressure on your ear. You could never put your head down. Sneezing, couldn't sneeze. That was incredibly restrictive. My second question is, um, it sounds like it was very frustrating for, for a long time um, trying to figure out what was actually going on. And my question is, for the doctors who either dropped you cold or couldn't diagnose you, once you were diagnosed and you wrote your book, or prior to writing your book, did you ever send your book or write them a letter saying, hey, this is what it was, you might want to look out for it in the future. I did. Darn, know. good question. No, never did. Um, in fact, it's sort of an issue uh, with my internist because he insisted that I had chronic fatigue and um, wasn't all that thrilled when I went to a neurologist and then came back and asked for a whole series of other tests. Uh, he does, of course, now know what I have. Um, but one of the things I'm grateful for is that the neurologist, I said, well, what am I going to do? You're telling me to get you know, lumbar punctures and tests for lupus and Lyme disease and all sorts of things. And well, who's going to get them for me? And he said, your internist. And I went, well, but he thinks I have chronic fatigue. And the neurologist said, go back to him. You need a good relationship with him. Tell him what's going on with you. Go back to him. And uh, that was the right thing to do. But no, the other people, no, I never did. I'm, I'm bad. Actually, that's OK. I actually do have one more question. You may have answered it in part. But after you were diagnosed, was there a sentinel moment uh, when you were able to pinpoint the vestibular disorder to a specific precipitating illness or injury? Yes. Um, the airplane, flying on the airplane with a cold. And 
Um, and that's, it's a more interesting answer than that. I, the year before I had the fistula from that airplane flight, um, I had labyrinthitis. I had a virus in my ear and I went to my internist um, and I was dizzy and he said, no problem, it'll dissipate in three or four weeks and it did. So the first time I was dizzy, um, I thought, okay, this is just going to go away. And that's why I didn't immediately go to the doctor. But then two years later, when I finally made my way to the otoneurologist, he took a whole long history. Um, and I told him that I had a cold, but I think I didn't tell him I flew with a cold. Um, and so it took him much longer to figure out um, because I didn't tell him that I flew with a cold. Uh, and then once he said what he thought it was, he sort of scratched his head and he said, but I don't know how this could have happened. And I went, I do, I flew with a cold. And, and we both realized, why didn't you tell me that? But you see, I didn't know to tell him that. And that's part of the complication that you all face, is if I had known what I had, then I would have known to tell him that, but I didn't. So thank you for the question. Thanks for the answers. Yeah. Was there ever discussion of cutting your vestibular nerve? Um, no. And that's because of the conditions I have. It's, it wouldn't be a relevant treatment. And I'm, I'm not medically inclined enough to know which conditions um, it would be. And I don't think you are either. It is one treatment yeah. for one specific condition. Yeah, in the back. Um, what medications uh, were you given for the vertigo and nausea? Um, well, meclizine, really useless, totally useless. I, I, um, maybe it helps some people, never helped me. Um, actually, there, there are two medications that help me. Um, one is Phenergan for nausea, but the main reason that it helps me, is, and is that for me the same? I'm, I'm not great with medication, but um, one of the main reasons it helps me just knocks me out. So what I try to do is travel and then arrive someplace in the evening so I can just take that and go to sleep and hopefully get up and feel better. Um, and I went through a lot of different medications for um, the endolymphatic hydrops, but the one that really, the diuretic that really helps me is not that much of a diuretic, it's Diamox. Um, and I, I've, I've, gosh, I'm on video, but I will mention this. Um, marijuana is very helpful. And there's a medication that my doctor has just prescribed for me called dronabinol, um, and it's I can't, I haven't even talked about this, but as part of the can't talk, can't think, you just feel dead. You feel so flat and dead. It's just unbelievable. Um, and I'll just be sitting there almost catatonic and I can take that dronabinol and I can talk again, you know, or read or do something. Um, so those medications have really helped a lot. You still have? Yeah, did you regain hearing? Yes. Lost a little again with the surgery, um, but I don't notice the difference. I mean, I, the ringing is the thing that I notice all the time. Are you able to ski? No. That is the, that is the oddest sensation imaginable. Um, when you have a hard time just balancing to be sliding, you know, you just, you just, there's no stability there for me. Wasn't able to do that. What about hiking? Hiking's great. Walking's great. Those are wonderful stabilizers for me. Just over here. Um, was that a, a marijuana-derived oral medication that you're talking about? Um, I, I don't know about the, the derivation of it, but um, it is an oral medication, dronabinol. You can look it up. It's a THC. was used most, where you see it the most used is for people with cancer. 
Yes. Yeah, so you're saying you drive to Bend, and it sounds like you've got family in North Carolina. Um, and do you fly or do you travel? I do. I do. Um, and it just involves a lot of planning and a lot of acknowledging that I'm not going to feel very good for a large part of the time. But it's worth it. Life's too small if you can't go anywhere, particularly when it's to visit family. So, I, you know, I, I'll admit, sometimes I feel really sorry for myself um, because a lot of the time I don't feel good. But um, that's okay. A lot of times, a lot of people don't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said before, there are lots of different types of vestibular disorders, and these types, these symptoms and, and uh, uh, impacts vary by disorder and by individual so much yeah. that a lot of the things that Sue can do, another person can't do. Um, <coughs> for example, um, and in regards to your question about hearing, Sue, Sue's hearing was regained. Some people completely lose their hearing, like for example with Meniere's disease. That's one of the progressions is that um, while the vertigo and dizziness or the vertigo symptoms subside, the hearing loss increases. So by the time you know, a person is you know, progressing the disease, they've completely lost their hearing. Um, other people uh, I've heard, uh, of, for example, with New Year's disease say that um, flying on a plane is absolutely no problem at all. Um, but it's the, and then in regards to the, um, uh, the medications, another thing that I have heard is that giving medications to dull the symptoms is counterproductive because it keeps you from compensating. And that's what the well, rehab does. Well, that's a... Um, the, the one medication that helped a lot um, early on was Valium. Um, and that's a good example of what Cynthia is talking about. Before, um, there was a gap in my diagnosis of, they knew I had a vestibular problem, but they didn't know what it was, and I needed to come back in six months. And so the doctor I was seeing said, um, boy, you got a lot going on. Let's try to get rid of all your symptoms. So they use Valium to get rid of all the symptoms. But it does have that major problem, is that the way to get through the vestibular disorder is to adapt, and it will block you from adapting. So you can't, you can't really be on it and adapt and move forward. Yeah? So since heat seems to exacerbate your symptoms, have you done any, have you tried anything like putting ice packs or staying in bend during the winter or anything like that to help at all? Um, mainly, I use avoidance. Um, so we have a hot tub in bend, I never go in it. Um, you know, it's just uh, we never take vacations to any place particularly warm. This is great. You know, I, I'm totally happy in Portland. It's never really too hot here. Um, except maybe in the dead of summer. But no, I don't do anything amazing to try to deal with the heat, except stay out of it. So you, you've talked about your physical therapy a number of times. Are there people then who are trained, are there physical therapists who have specific training around working with people with vestibular disorders? Absolutely, huge field, um, doing um, rehabilitation for vestibular disorders. And it's enormously helpful. In fact, it's one of the main things that you need to do. Um, there's a whole battery of um, exercises and um, techniques that you use to get your eyes and your ears and your muscles working back together again. So is there problems in different parts? I mean, it, the availability, I'm wondering, obviously here you're doing well, but say somebody was in Boom, Alaska or someplace that like that. You know, is there distribution around where there's more 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 likely to find the, the specialist than another? Area? That's a really good question. Um, in the Vestibular Disorders Association, one of the things that we've seen is if you live in a city like Portland, um, where there are large hospitals and medical centers, generally you're going to be okay, um, both from a diagnosis and treatment rehab perspective. Uh, I don't know if you know 
um, Suzanne Johnson, but she's from Denver. She says, actually, it's along the coast is where all the major rehab centers are, certainly in, in Minnesota, Chicago as well. But if you're not in those centers, you're gonna have a much more difficult time finding your way to diagnosis. But there are um, balance centers that have audiologists and physical therapists that are much more geographically dispersed than the major hospitals. Um, but still, I think it's more difficult if you live in a small, community that's not near a major hospital center. But there are a lot, I'd say there are many more audiologists, physical therapists practice than there are neurootology practices. And finding people who specialize in vestibular disorders is one of the focuses of our organization, which is why we have a provider directory for people. Because just going to, you know, a neurologist is not going to say that they're experienced in So what keeps you going? Whew. So what do you mean? What do you mean? So what what are the things that help? Like you said, you've got you've got something that is is serious affects all kinds of parts of your life. People don't understand it. They look at you and go, <laughs> "What's wrong with you? You you look yeah. fine." So what are the things that help you find the strength and the sustenance? It, who or what? helps you to get up in the morning and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it through the day, and only that I'm going to be able to appreciate the day. Oh, that's a really good question. I have a fabulous husband, and I want to toast my husband. I mean, think about all the things that I've said to you, and think about how active we were together, and what he's had to go through, and he's not sick. Um, so he can't go out anymore and we don't entertain all that much anymore and our traveling is greatly curtailed and so I have a, a wonderful husband. Um, I have always been a person who celebrated my interior life. Um, I'm a writer, meditator, um, contemplator. Um, so I tell myself, and I'm pretty satisfied with this, that um, had this illness not happened, then that would have been postponed, and that I'm more at peace with life, more grateful for my life, um, because I have this illness and the insight that it's given me. Um, so, you know, actually, a slower life is a good thing. And for a long time, I missed uh, the transition to aging, because I got sick when I was in my late 40s. So I thought, you know, this is all happening because I'm sick. And now at 65, I go, whoa, I'm old. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe this is happening because I'm old. Um, but thank you, it was a nice question. Thank you very much. <laughs>